Thank you to everyone who is joining us as well for today's session. So this is the Forging Pathways Through Collaboration and Partnerships theme. And this session is designed as a bit of a round table with members from the organisation Mediators Beyond Borders Oceania, which we call MBBO. MBBO is a regional chapter of Mediators Beyond Borders International, which has the acronym MBBI. And our mission is to promote the principles and practices of peaceful conflict management and resolution in the Oceania regional communities through developing that capacity and skills for peace. And that's done through sharing techniques around mediated and non-adversarial collaborative and dialogue-based conflict management practices. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome the presenters of this roundtable today. We have Ken Waldron, Ken is an experienced commercial negotiator, mediator and businessman working across agribusiness, global trade and environmental issues. Ken is also the chair of MBBO. We also have Peter Korn and Peter is a legal practitioner in Shanghai, specialising in Chinese corporate, commercial, regulatory practice and environmental law. Peter has lived and worked in China for over 28 years and he's joining us today from Shanghai. And he may be having a little bit of issue joining us at the moment with video and sound, but we'll see how that progresses. So welcome, Peter. We also have Nicholas Sadu, and Nicholas is a mediator and lawyer with over 20 years of practice and experience in Australia and Fiji. Nicholas is also the secretary of MBBO. And Ken and Nicholas are both members of the Climate Change Policy Project with MBBI, as well as being climate reality leaders with Al Gore's organisation. And we were also going to be joined by Maria Goretti Nuovesi, who is the Senior Environmental Legal Officer for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and also the Chair of the Pacific Network for Environmental Law. Maria was going to be joining us from Fiji. However, unfortunately, due to the COVID situation and personal circumstances, she's unable to make it today and is an apology. And myself, I'm Claire Holland. I'm the Director of the Conflict Management and Resolution Program at James Cook University. And I'm a conflict management, management practitioner and a researcher. I'm also a board member of MBBO and Peter and Maria are both members as well. So today, we're here to discuss this question of how can we sustain our existence in perpetuity without destroying our resource base and each other? The management and resolution of conflicts, particularly stemming from environmental disputes, is really multidisciplinary. So um, practitioners and people who are involved in these types of conflicts, they're often working across borders, across cultures, language groups, and managing really different needs, interests, and preferred outcomes of individuals and different groups. So to narrow the scope of our conversation today, um, we're going to focus on this importance of people-centred approaches and ensuring that the voice of those affected is at the table, particularly when working with environmental conflicts. So to set the scene, I'll pass over to Ken and Ken ask you to start by sharing with us from your research and experience, what does it mean to engage a people-centred approach? Thank you, Claire. Um, well, conflict resolvers get engaged in uh, when pathways through disruption meet a road blockage. And so from my perspective, the starting point is always to removing blockages is to start from people, not things. You know, I recently watched a wonderful documentary film called uh, There Once Was an Island. And this is about a tiny Pacific Atoll, Taku Atoll, 250 kilometres east of Bougainville. And the film tracks the story of a Polynesian community living with climate change. It's a 400 strong community and they've been able to live there for over a thousand years, essentially on seafood and local vegetables. The people of Taku have traditionally placed great value in the retention of their indigenous practices and their religion and their culture. And as a remote community that doesn't have regular connection with other places such as Papua New Guinea, Bougainville or other places for that matter, they've unusually in this day and age been able to practice the traditional cultures without a lot of outside influence. However, as the film identifies and illustrates vividly, this one metre high 
island is exposed to the creeping impact of climate change. Each year, they lose more beach. Each year, they must relocate their houses and move their families. Their cropping plots are inundated now with salt water and becoming unproductive. Now, this story is not new to any of us with some awareness of climate change. However, as is, is illustrated quite sensitively in this movie, the story isn't about the islands. The story is actually about the people who live on the islands. It's about the impact on them and their life, their livelihoods and their cultures. As this island becomes increasingly unsustainable, the communities and the responsible authorities are now looking for solutions and these solutions inevitably are disruptive. They contemplate relocation, loss of connection, you know, potential dispersal of families, moving into unfamiliar uh, locations and traditions and methodologies. We know as conflict resolvers that these are all just the base ingredients for dispute. This climate related uh, disruption is about people and all climate related and environmental disputes in my view, ultimately distilled down to about people. Thanks, Ken. Really key point there around the importance of people. Um, and maybe again, returning to this people-centered approach, what do you see as being really key in that basic shift towards conflict resolution when working with people? You're muted, Ken. Ken? Muted. Apologies, that inadvertently happened. I didn't do it deliberately. A characteristic of the Western world, Claire, we have a worldview that focuses on ownership. This lies at the heart of much of our legal system and our economic structures. In the developed Western framework, we own things. Things belong to us. Significantly, Indigenous communities often express their relationship with the land and the environment that they, they say, we belong to it. They belong to a place or a space. So in other words, the ownership relationship, such as it exists, is reversed. They are part of, inseparable from, and their culture derives from this relationship. They experience the environment and the relationship with the environment in a much more holistic manner than say we in the industrial west. Now if we contrast that then with the contemporary environment dispute paradigm, we tend in, the, in, in that paradigm to break down disputes into components, engineering, property, law, legal, economic, finance, ecology. And so it goes on and we send in specialists to explore solutions and they they focus on their discipline-based solutions and inevitably often resulting in a, numeric and con a numerical and quantitative outcome. Of course, the real point here is that's not a people-based approach. This is a discipline-centered approach. And the relevance of a people-centered approach to the environmental conflict space is to recognize that people who live in, work in, and depend on the environment in which they exist, in general, have something much more personal at stake than a numerical outcome. So in a people-centered approach to sustainability and environmental conflict, it's really important for us to be able to explore and develop understandings and acknowledge the differences in perspectives that exist between the parties and their relationship with the environment that is being disrupted. This is a perspective that we conflict managers and resolvers have to take to the conflict. I hope that answers the question, Claire. Thank you, Ken. And you know, you highlighted some really interesting points there, particularly around those ideas of ownership. Um, you know, the importance of highlighting that conflicts really are about people, not things. And 
with some of those examples, you just really gave a um, clear indication about why conflict management is a multidisciplinary field, the way in which there are so many different players and needs and interests and perspectives um, to bring to uh, conflicts as they arise. Uh, now, Peter, I might um, hand over to you. So we might just see how your audio is working. Are you with Thank us you. today? Oh, fantastic, Peter. So welcome um, to the panel today. Now, you've recently written an article for the Chinese Journal of Environmental Law, and in that you advocate for the adoption of mediated, mediated approaches to disputes, particularly using a facilitative approach in contrast to the legal or the adversarial arbitrated type processes for environmental conflicts. So could you share with us today a little bit around why you think that this mediated approach is more appropriate, particularly for the types of disputes you're working with in China? Thanks, Claire. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, yeah, I've been here in China for quite a number of years doing mediations. And um, a lot of times we come face to face with um, the challenge of um, dealing with cultural differences in the context of mediation. Uh, there's been a revolution in mediation styles from the traditional styles to more modern. And one of these is the facilitative style, as Claire mentioned. But the problem with the facilitative style, while it's a very professional style and you know, uh, there's a lot of training throughout the world in it, it um, by nature, you know, because it's arisen out of the United States and to a lesser extent Australia, it carries with it certain cultural baggage. So um, that's created a problem because we've had to learn how to distinguish the cultural baggage in the facilitative style of mediation um, from what we really need to do to address the cultural um, aspects of mediations here. So what I mean by the Western cultural baggage is that, um, you know, this facilitative style carries with it a focus on individualism and autonomy. Um, and it means that it expects the participants to really focus exclusively on their own best interests. It doesn't look at um, it from the perspective of uh, the culture and the participants in the culture, which may be thinking more broadly than that, what's in the best interests of their group or their um, immediate social community. And that may be a business community or it may be uh, um, you know, a village or something like that. Uh, the other um, cultural aspects uh, that are Western baggage is uh, priorities given to individual needs uh, the conflict is treated as though it's separate from one's social group. Um, uh, also, the Western style focuses on openness of communication in all aspects. You know, obviously that's a good thing, but um, in you know the context I'm working in, often it's not appropriate at certain points to have complete openness of communication. So um, now we look at you know, how we can bring facilitative mediation into the context that I'm working in, which is an East Asian context. And we have to recognize that there's certain values here that underpin the way people behave. It's just the way that they've been brought up. And um, one is, you know, in East Asian societies, including China, you've got Confucianism and its main values. You've got the focus on collectivism rather than individualism, and you've got a prevalence or concern with losing or giving face. And uh, I think that may have been uh, come to the forefront in a lot of the stuff that's been reported in the media, but um, that means there's an ingrained personal value that involves being treated with respect or dignity and to preserve standing in the broader community or cultural context. So, you know, how can we tailor um, facilitative mediation so that it addresses all of these different aspects? Well, first of all, um, we have to focus on communication. What is the most appropriate form of communication? And um, for that, we have to really understand when it is 
really appropriate to move on to open communication. We might have to do a lot more caucusing so that um, there's a, a face saving way of actually getting to the bottom of what's really behind the dispute. And secondly, um, we need to be sensitive to the cultural context in which uh, the participants are operating. So um, it's not just about finding out what motivates um, their personal interests in the dispute. It's about understanding what they're dealing with in their, cult, in their, in their broader community, what may be driving them. So we need to ask different sorts of questions as mediators to really understand what's going to drive them and incentivize them towards reaching settlement. Um, in this context, selecting a mediator is really important. So you need a, a mediator who's familiar with uh, the cultural styles and the business styles in some cases of all the parties. And when you've got multi-party disputes, that could be very challenging. You may need co-mediation because there's no one mediator with all the languages and cultural background that can address that. And you also need to understand the background of the um, respect to participants in the mediation because you can't just generalize and say, for example, oh, they're Chinese, they must be this way. They may have very specific backgrounds that cause them to act in a slightly different way than what you'd expect. So all these things have to go into uh, planning for a successful mediation. Thanks, Peter. If I can just probe one particular point you mentioned in there, you asked yourself the question, how do you adapt facilitative mediation to the disputes that you're dealing with in China? Um, and then you highlighted the importance of all these cultural and historical aspects. Why even use facilitative mediation as a process? Why is that something that you're trying to adapt? Or was it just the way in which you framed the question? Yeah. Um... I mean, mediation itself is a good thing. And as you rightly pointed out, there are different styles of mediation. Um, you mentioned a sort of an adjudicative style at the beginning, uh, and that was used in sort of traditional forms of medi mediation. That does feel comfortable to um, participants in the East Asian context. They're used to that, but it may not be the most professional form of mediation actually addressing all of the interests involved. So um, there's also, um, so facilitative is good for that, as long as we remain true to the core advantages of facilitative, which is to really dig out the uh, true interests of the parties and the context in which they're working. So um, that's the really strong point of facilitative mediation. Of course, at times uh, we may jump over to sort of more of an evaluative style. Sometimes the parties may feel more comfortable with a certain evaluative component. And in this cultural context that we often use that, jump backwards and forwards between evaluative facilitative with the approval of the parties. Thanks, Peter. And thanks for sharing those parts of your experience. It was interesting you're saying, um, I think you used the word professional mediation, um, which is something that you um, try to work with, which might actually go across a few different styles of mediation, depending on what is required of the dispute and taking into account all of those um, considerations around what is culturally appropriate, what might be the uh, in the interests of the um, people involved in the dispute. I think you also mentioned that it was really important um, in the context you're working in, that the focus is not on the individuals who are involved in the dispute, but it's actually greater than that. It's the what is in the best interest of the community, of the collective, of you know what is going on around um, the dispute. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. Claire. Thanks, Claire. Very well put. Great. Um, and Nicholas. Um, You've had some specific um, experience and also doing research in Fiji and Oceania. And just throwing that out to you now, what's, what are you seeing and what is working in terms of this people-centred approach and maybe what needs more attention? Thanks, Claire. Um, yes, and Ken and, and Peter highlighted some really good points. Um, 
starting on with, with people and mediation and the facilitative approach to conflict resolution. Um, from my experience as a mediator and lawyer and having lived in Fiji, um, I do see the benefits of a facilitated approach um, working in the Oceania region. I mean, these are things that that approach you know, resonates with the values and cultures of the people. Um, however, um, from what I've sort of read and, and having talked to people in the region is there, there's lacking of mechanisms and platforms for resolving conflicts, um, things which could enhance the sustainable development of these regions. So I'd like to touch on three things. Um, the first being access to justice. The second is um, environmental conflicts in the region. And finally, the empty chair. Um, in the Oceania region, there's a lot of focus on access to justice. Um, but in my view, and when talking to people, is that it's mainly on providing legal aid and assistance to existing legal frameworks and institutions. Um, I personally think uh, there's got to be a bit more need, there's a need for more informal mechanisms. So communities can have access to resolving conflicts and mediation is an ideal process for this. Um, and recently a, a technical report by the Secretariat of Pacific Regional Environmental uh, Program and other regional bodies created an integrated island management framework. And this was for achieving an island-wide integrated sustainable development goal. And they adopted a people-centered approach. And interestingly, it identified 10 principles. And one of those principles was resolving conflicts. Um, in it, they said, to establish, they needed to establish institutions with authority to mediate conflicts and a forum for stakeholders to be able to discuss and resolve issues and views in a timely manner. Now, for me, this supports the need for conflict resolution processes um, in the region, which we've all talked about this um, earlier on. But when I did some research and I looked for literature or case studies on climate uh, conflict and, and climate resolution processes, I didn't find much at all. There's a lot written in the Sub-Saharan, the Sahel Zone and the Middle East, but very little in this region. I asked the question, is it because um, it's not considered a climate zone yet? Perhaps not, but um, I see the risk. There is risk there. When you consider the effects of climate change in the region, um, the adaptation to it, uh, climate change induced human mobility. And apart from that, you can look at even large scale development on traditional um, owned land gives rise to conflicts and they are could and there could be environment conflicts so say for example if we looked at um, and I'll just give it a very rough example here is say the migration of a community from a coastal area um, it moved from a coastal area to higher grounds due to rising sea level and that community have moved they're living comfortably they're all well you know and in the years go by the community of 100 grows to 200 you have a potential of conflict of issues arising over land, scarcity of food, housing shortage. And then you have this potential of conflict with neighbors and even perhaps with the policymakers, given that that policy of movement may have been made 10, 15 years ago. So there is this conflict or potential of conflict. So conflict and disputes in the environmental space can also arise over natural resources, which is abundance in, in the region. And these involve minerals, forests, forests, rivers, oceans, land, something Ken touched on earlier, um, as well as large scale development. And these resources and the ownership are very much part of the individual and, and their communities. And, and Ken touched on this quite well. So what do these communities, these vulnerable communities have? I mean, what voices do they have and how can they have their voices heard if they do not agree with a policy or government regulation, or with a landowner or developer. I, I'm a firm believer that at this, at the moment, the traditional interactive and facilitative dialogue process in the Oceania region, mainly in Fiji and Polynesian islands, the concept of Talano is a wonderful tool. Now Talano is defined as a process of inclusive, participatory and transparent dialogue with the purposes of sharing stories, building empathy, and making wise decisions for the collective good. It is less formal and more intuitive. And again, something where Peter, uh, Peter touched out on collectivism in being in the Oceania region. And my experience is this, is that I have observed and participated in this with families and communities who have come together to resolve conflicts through this Talanoa session. 
and usually it's over a you know, fairly lengthy session with a big bowl of kava. Um, and the process sort of is, is non-confrontational. It's not critical. They don't criticize the participants. Um, it's through storytelling. There's respect shown, understanding. You get to appreciate each other's needs and then you work to resolve issues. Um, but sometimes this process cannot resolve it. So then again, you resort to a more the other traditional aspect of where an elder or chief may make a determinative process. Um, and, that's our, and that's something that Peter also touched on and then the different approach of that. So I, I think conflict management processes and mediation is important for resolving all forms of conflicts, not only environmental conflicts in the Oceania region, but it is crucial when designing these processes, the cultural context as outlined by Peter and the traditional practices of the various cultures in the region are taken into consideration. Also, the import, it is important that traditional authorities are consulted, that is the chiefs, the elders, the wise men and women, and even religious bodies, as religion is a very, plays a very important part in, in, in the Oceania and in the Pacific culture. Um, it cannot be an external framework alone in a one size fits all. To do that, to develop such processes in Turkey, there must be collaboration and partnership with the owners, with the traditional owners, the leaders, their practices and knowledge, you know, bringing the community and institutions. And when you do this collaboration for any dispute resolution or conflict management process, we'll get an effective buy-in. So I think that that is something that we've all touched on. There has got to be a collaborative and a community approach to it with the input. And finally, which is the empty chair, which is slightly different to what I've spoken about earlier, but it's something is of importance that we need to consider. And, and that is when we, when we talk about the empty chair in an environmental context, is usually in an environmental conflict, it's the parties who are having a dispute. And at times it is their interest in me, it is their interests that are being considered, but not necessarily the voice of the environment or the nature, natural resource that has been affected. And it's, it, it sort of moves away. It's not about them, but it's about the other parties. Yet, it is that empty chair, which is the most salient party in the conflict. So it is symbolic that they have a presence in the room, at the chair, uh, at the table, sorry, or in the circle, so that those involved in the conflict process can be aware of the interest and voice that that chair has in the process. We are here in mediation or in a conflict resolution process or in a Talanoa because of the interests of that chair. Thank you. I'll like the end on that. Thanks, Nicholas. So who's the chair? Who's the in chair, the chair? The chair is the actual issue of the environment. Say if it's the, the you, you are having a dispute over uh, a river or, or land, people tend to forget they're sort of saying, oh, I lost this right, I lost that, I lost this. But what is the voice of the actual environment or actual resource that has been affected? Mm. So people can keep reflecting on it, what it would have looked like, what we would have done. Yeah. So, so designing get... a process that invites the river to be part of the process or the land yeah. or the... Um... Yeah. And, and, and I say that is because what also got me thinking is that in recent... Um, in New Zealand, I think it was the Fanga New River where it got legal status uh, while it started through a, um, a legislative court process. But I understand from my research that prior to all of that, there was a lot of mediation and ADR process, which led to a legal status being granted to a, to a river. Um, so the impact wow. of that is, uh, and also in India. So I, I see that, you know, that that is a powerful statement so people can really connect to that. Yeah, Nick and Claire, that yeah. sort of ties in with the trends um, in China as well, because um, we've seen a comeback of Taoism, which has its core philosophy, harmony between human society and the ecosystem. So they also recognize the chair that you're talking about. And it's come so far that um, it's actually even become enshrined in new Chinese policy called eco-civilization. They have this Taoist principle at the center of it. And they're trying to um, resolve disputes now with this as a core principle. 
Mm, fantastic. And I think Nicholas and Peter, you both drew on some really um, key, I uh, guess, ideas around how do you bring people together who are in conflict around um, environmental issues specifically, which we're discussing today, and the importance of, uh, Nicholas, you mentioned dialogue and storytelling and appreciating needs. And Peter, you referred to finding out the interests. Um, and then both of you now just mentioning also allowing for that empty chair or the um, recognition of the land or the river or the mountain or something else also having its own story and needs and interests. Um, so how is this done? Like in terms of actual process, and this might actually tie in with a question that did come in on the um, WOVA app before, you know, are there specific models that can be used that ensures that communities are involved in decision-making and at the same time is respectful of local cultural practices? which I guess is maybe also referring to both decision-making and the environmental management approaches. So I know um, you've sort of already touched on um, a few of those things, uh, Nicholas and Peter, but was there anything else um, that you'd like to add? Maybe starting with you, Peter. Well, I, I think too, in, this is a very important principle that needs to be enshrined in the context of climate change moving forward. So it's not just to be applied in pure climate change disputes, it's to be applied in any dispute as a fundamental principle, a fundamental value. Uh, it's not to wait for the participants to raise it, it should be a value, a core value of the mediator and the mediation process that we do um, let the parties know um, that we are treating the environment as a participant and any sort of resolution to the dispute must take account of the environmental implications of what they agree. What do you think, Nick? Um, yeah, uh, look, I agree. And I think if you, if you sort of stick to saying there's a model, I'm always weary of models. Yes, I mean, we all sort of got trained and got taught that mediation is a model that you follow. But I think it's important that, yes, you use a model as a framework, but within that model or something in which Ken says, he said, there's got to be various tools. And, and looking at the, the question is posed, it's a good question because you then use those models and you look at what's happening traditionally. There's a lot of traditional, as Peter said, in China, the Taoists, in the Pacific, in the cultures, they've been resolving conflicts long before the concept of the Western form of mediation came along. And if you look at, in Fiji, they've been doing... Um, at Talanoa, they've got other structures in place for different things. So they've got different processes and different things. So I'd say is you take what's in existence now and then you look at what is in the Western concept of mediation. And I find that sometimes say, one of the difficulties in the, um, in the Pacific and in the Oceania region is because of the way the structure of the communities where you've got hierarchical, you've got a chief or you may have an elderly and then you have a spokesman so the common man may not be able to openly voice what he has to say because he's talking to a chief. So there's got to be a certain level of respect. So if you brought in a model or, oh, I'll take away, not a model, if you brought in a process and you adopted, say, the reality testing of mediation and you've had a skilled mediator or you could train the spokesperson who is actually facilitating the dialogue between the parties and use the traditional method, but brought in and saying, now let's reality test it in his own skillful ways and within his own respected culture. He could be able to do that. And that then I think brings a level playing field. And like Peter says, not in environment, but in any conflict. So that's where I'm sort of talking. You've got to have that buy-in um, and the model together. Uh, you know, you're creating a, a, a Western model, taking away the Western part of it, bringing the good and fusing them. Nice. Well, you touched on a few things there, Nicholas. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the importance of having yeah, your understanding of the culture, a bit of a model or um, some guidance around a process that um, is then appropriate for um, the needs. And I think you said the buy-in of the group that you're working with. And you also touched on mediator skills. 
So I might actually put this over to you, Ken, because I know you're involved in some um, water issues in Australia, which, you know, is pretty big environmental conflicts. Um, what do you think are key, uh, important, I guess, skills that someone who is coming in to support communities in conflict around environmental issues um, can bring to the table? Uh, yeah, good question. And I find it's sort of not a simple answer. But uh, if, if we go to the theme of what was being asked about models and so on, if, 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 if I can use a musical metaphor, that when you start to learn to play musical instruments, they put you through these boring things called scales. And until you master the scales, you can't actually master the instrument. And if we hang on to models, prescriptive models, uh, and take those models, uh, it's a, let me jump from metaphor to metaphor, it's a bit like taking a hammer to every particular problem. So your really skilled conflict resolver has to have what I call adaptive conflict resolution skills. You have to have an ability to move from this to that. I'll come back to the question of water in Australia in a minute, but if we look at, say, Oceania, right, it's not well understood, but it is the fourth or fifth biggest continent in the world, in the globe, right? And it has but 2% of the population or less. And it has 1,600 languages, which is 22% of the languages. So if you think about that and say, well, language is almost, almost a metaphor for culture, then you are dealing with a really complex environment. So you go back to that little story I gave earlier about this, this Taku Atoll having to move. One, you've got a unique language. And two, the suggested places to move them is across from being fishermen into a land-based existence where they will have to learn to be farmers. So, so you think about the complexity of that and the inherent conflict that's going to arise as an outcome of that solution. And, it, and, and inevitably conflict resolvers will get drawn into that because there will inevitably be a conflict. So coming back to water, again, you have the same problem. I actually like what uh, Nicholas points out, this empty chair. And I love the, the, the fact that in New Zealand, they've given legal status to rivers. I happen to be working on the uh, Murray-Darling, one of the community reference bodies to the Murray-Darling um, body, right? Which is, it's a really quite a political body. And, and we give no voice to the river. Everyone else has got a voice, right? And when you, when you talk about environment, you get back to that polarity that I've talked about before. But so, so as a conflict resolver engaged in that space, you are perpetually moving around and you have to be quite dynamic. So I think, I, I think Claire, on another discussion you have, I, I've had elsewhere, conflict, conflict management is as much a discipline or as much an art form as it is a discipline. Right. The, going back to the finish off on my musical metaphor, your best instrument virtuosos actually, well, they're artists. We know that. They know the scales, but I know the scales, but I'm not a virtuoso. And my point being, it is a really adaptive skill that one has to take. Mm. Thanks, Ken. Uh, it is. It's so interesting to think who are the people that are going to be engaged and supporting these dialogues and conversation and storytelling and taking into account the systemic complexity that you described and then also getting to an outcome that is going to support the communities and the environment. And drawing on, uh, Nicholas, one of your points that there are a lot of conflicts occurring uh, in the environment and particularly in Oceania at the moment, but not a lot of research um, that is being at least published and shared um, around what approaches are being taken, what's worked well, um, maybe that um, cross-pollination of knowledge for different approaches that are most appropriate um, when different things occur. I so, said, uh, just bringing all of this now back to our conference theme, which is forging pathways through collaboration. Just some final thoughts from everyone on the panel. 
Um, do you have anything else to highlight around what you see as being needed in this area of moving forward, um, particularly in the area of co environmental conflict? So I might start uh, with Nicholas and then Peter and then Ken. Thanks, Claire. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned about not enough research being in, in the in the region on, on environmental conflict, and uh, as I was reflecting on it, perhaps I think it's, it's reflective on the people and the values of those in the Oceania region. They aren't confrontational people. They are not sort of, they're mostly peace loving. They don't go into conflict and they have their own ways in resolving conflict. But as we know, over time, a lot of this can change. And I think from, from my perspective, I think it's important that there are frameworks, there are tools, um, that people can have and can have access to so that everyone has a voice uh, and ability to access that level of, of uh, justice and be able to sort of get some form of equalization, if I can call it that, and, and be able to share that. So it is important in terms of while there may not be sort of a large scale conflict, but having in place processes and tools now to sort of manage and resolve them when they do arise, you know, and having those different adaptive tools as Ken mentioned. So I think that, that is important and something that we should look forward to. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think mediation in itself is a wonderful process, has lo loads of potential for greater usage throughout the region, not just in a domestic context, but also in a cross-border context as well, involving different cultures. But what's holding it back? Um, We've all seen that there's now an international convention which helps its credibility, the Singapore Convention. Um, it's because um, there's not enough knowledge about how do you find really good mediators with the right skills and what, what is mediation? You know, a, a lot of, there's not that much knowledge about how it's different and its advantages over, you know, uh, judicial processes or arbitration. So I think one of the key things is um, building upon what Nick and Ken have said about the experience so far, um, developing um, readily accessible pools of mediators that um, can be um, drawn upon very easily and very quickly, and then applying this process in a much more widespread fashion so it gets much bigger and more universal, universal recognition for its value. Thanks, Peter and Ken. Yes, I don't have a lot to add to what uh, Nicholas and Peter have said. Uh, I, I think one of the things we all need to strive to do in this space is, um, is picking, getting more space at the, at the table for the empty chairs. We just need more of those. Um, and the other thing that I have, which is a bit of a, um, pet, pet position of mine, I don't always win this one, but I argue all the time that in, environmental disputes are not for the, they're not for the courtroom, right? They end up there mostly, but they shouldn't be. They're, 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 a, they're, they're a different sort of dispute. And I'm not sure courts, in fact, have the skills and to, to be able to resolve that, and which is, gets back to one of the things that MBVO, Mediators Beyond Borders Oceania, is committed to doing is, is sponsoring and working with to, to develop a set of skills and tool, a toolkit, if you like, for environmental conflict resolution in the Oceania space. Now, I have to say, I uh, am aware of one of the, pro, uh, one of the presenters this morning and already moved on this. So they're on my list to ring up and talk to and to, to um, work with because it's a really important thing, reinforces Peter's comment. We need to build a pool of skilled, environment and culturally aware mediators and conflict resolvers. Thanks, Ken. And I think um, on behalf of Mediators Beyond Borders Oceania, that's a goal of us as an organisation, which is going to be member driven um, to have people who have an interest in sharing and developing their own skill set, I guess working towards that artistry, as you, as you have described, Ken, um, to be able to have, a, um, I guess, a place to go for collaborative practice, peer-to-peer -peer engagement and learning, and, you know, eventually support and training um, for 
particular conflicts as they may arise. So thank you to all the panellists for um, your discussion so far today. We've had one more question come through. And to anyone else who's listening, if you do have any questions you'd like to pose to the panellists, um, please feel free to pop them in the chat box. Um, so this question is asking that in most societies, um, they are against mining activities for environmental protection. However, sustainable mining is important for socioeconomic development. So is there anyone on the panel that could share um, an experience where you've acted in conflict where people are rejecting a strategic project? Yeah, um, yeah, that's happened very, as you, you're probably aware of the Belt and Road and China's big initiative, and that does involve um, investment, a lot of infrastructure, including mines. And uh, yeah, that has brought a lot of um, companies uh, in conflict with local communities that are very concerned about the impact on their environment. So, um, yeah, the, um, the concept of sustainable mining and um, involves a lot of community um, development and community respect, not only giving jobs to the community, but also developing the mine in a way that um, preserves the environment for the community to continue uh, unaffected by the mine. So um, all this is becoming um, very important in the mining world to maintain the credibility of the industry. Um, it's not as um, consistently applied as we'd want it to, but um, the concept of sustainable mining is becoming more feasible as a result of these concepts that, are, that we're seeing that are being applied. Mm, thanks, Peter. And I might also just jump in there that I know the approach that is being taken with environmental conflicts is that it's not looking for ever a resolution because you're very unlikely to ever resolve an environmental res um, conflict, but it's ongoing environmental conflict management because the conflict relates to um, you know, different ideas of what should or shouldn't be done with the environment, different approaches to protection, different ways of engaging with the people, changing values over time. So environmental conflicts are enduring. They will continue. And so when you're looking at a particular conflict at a particular point in time, it's where are we on this environmental conflict management spectrum um, and what needs to be done now? Are we in crisis um, or are we in sort of conflict management maintenance. Um, so that I think understanding an approach, um, particularly around environmental conflicts and that there will unlikely ever really be a true resolution. It's just always ongoing. Yes, Claire, can I add a perspective as well, which I'm, uh, probably adds only perspective to the answers already given. Uh, again, one of the balance, one of the, the near impossible balancing acts you have in this space, not just, uh, you know, for those who are the disputants, is you're often dealing with a worldview, which is, um, and, and balancing that worldview is difficult. So on the one hand, you've got the pessimist, which is we shouldn't take environmental risks and two, you know, we're all ruining the planet. And on the other side, you've got the optimist who says, well, we need to use the resources that are for the benefit of mankind. And, and if, 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 those, if you start with those two almost polar opposites, you've, you are going to be dealing with a perspective view that's just really hard to overcome and bridge. And look, if I go back to my university days, which is so long ago that I hadn't had hair, right? But the, the reality is we were either for or against and there was no, there was no communication in between. Yet as conflict resolvers, and probably with a bit of maturity, you realise that your, your challenge in the conflict space is to bring about this, this resolution uh, and, and to, get, to get communication going. And it is a real challenge. It's, again, it get back to this issue of art form. So, it, 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 and your point, Claire, this is ongoing it's, and it's going to, it, not going to get less it's going to get more and there'll be there'll be a, a what you call a concertina at some point where it, it will if you like 
be dramatic. Papua New Guinea has this perpetual problem all the time up in the highlands between communities and the, uh, the, the miners. Thank you, Ken. Um, I might just check if there are any other questions um, from the chat or the Q&A um, that anyone specifically would like addressed to a particular panel member or just to the group. Maybe if we're waiting to see if anything else comes in. Nicholas, was there anything you wanted to add um, to those points discussed just now? Um, in terms of sort of what the, how to resolve it, I, I think Peter touched on it because there's just so many layers. And, and if you look at mining and he touched on something there, it's a very, it's a, it's a facilitative dialogue process. And as I think Peter did touch on it earlier on, especially when you're talking about mining and community and, and the various stakeholders. And, and touch on you, you're not going to resolve the dispute, but you can manage the conflict by having those multi-party, multi-tiered conversations, and then sort of resolving a particular issue or concern by one party here, then bringing it up to the next level, and then you bring it up to the next level, to the next tier, and then in collectively or sort of slowly you're bringing in the right people to eventually you get to saying, okay, now we've got the right players in the room. How do we then, is there a resolution or is there going to be a management of a conflict and work it out. And as we all know, going through a mediation process and, and, a, and a facilitated mediation process uh, allows each party's interest to be heard. So you can do some trading, you know, someone might say, okay, we'll do this, but what's the benefit, what's the downside? Whereas if you go into, into, say, into a legal process in the court, it's really, you've taken, you, you've taken your ability away to express your needs or something you can say as much as but then it'll be a judgment or a decision handed down by the court. Interest and in all that not taken, it's a legal perspective given. So you are kind of stuck with it, but your actual interest is not addressed. You can still, the conflict would still resolve. You resolve the dispute about mining. They can say, yes, the law says this, but the conflict that is in the person and in the party with that feels like can't touch that, you know, it's the individual and the land, it's one that hasn't resolved. So that could go on for generations and then it you know, surfaces again. So I think it's these things, there's, there's really no, I, I've never experienced, but just sort of looking and understanding and coming from the Pacific where you can understand where you know, a lot of conversations take place and sometimes they take over days to resolve it. And I think that's how you know, environmental conflicts will be resolved or should be resolved, but it is costly, time and absorbent, but yeah. Yeah, part of the problem, Claire, I think, is parties in those disputes can hide behind the law and use it as a, an excuse not to communicate fully about interests, as Nick says. Just getting everybody in the same room or the multi-stakeholders in the context of a mediation is a huge achievement, then you're halfway there. Mm. Thank you, Peter. So just drawing together a little bit of a summary of some really key points that have been highlighted. Um, the idea that, that you have adversarial approaches, which is your legalistic approaches to resolving disputes, but that often environmental disputes are more suited to um, models and processes such as facilitative mediation models, where you're able to engage in dialogue and storytelling and questioning. And you just highlighted then, Nicholas, negotiation trade-offs um, in a way that can take into account that empty chair. So recognising the environment has a place in the room. And throughout, you've all touched on the importance of recognising that people have different worldviews. Ken, that was your um, word and concept at the end there. And that the approach to worldviews may take into account different ways of um, thinking, of um, expressing yourself of comfort within a process. So the way in which you communicate, focus on individualism and collectivism, cultural um, considerations, language, all of that needs to be considered when drawing together a process that is going to be most appropriate to support the ongoing management or even maybe the resolution of a conflict um, in this environmental space. So thank you all um, so much. We are getting to, we're at the end for our um, session here today. And so thank you to everyone as well who um, was here as a participant and has listened to this discussion. 
I might just share our um, first screen again so that if anyone does want to contact anyone from the panel directly or mediators beyond borders, uh, there's the contact details up there. Um, so Nicholas and Ken um, can be contacted at the info email for Mediators Beyond Borders. And thank you all very much for participation and engagement here today. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Bye. Claire, thanks, everyone. Thank you all for your presentation. Um, and thank you for all who have attended the next sessions. Um, there are some sessions that are still going the next sessions will begin at um, 3.15. So enjoy the rest of the day for the conference and um, we look forward to hearing, hearing back from everyone. But thanks again to all of our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.